Ooh, I wish Molly and Charlie could be here and see this crowd. <laughs> you know, the Lord said, go forth and multiply. The Jordans believed what he said. <laughs> And so man, this is the first time that we've had a reunion in 26 years. Joyce, Joyce Smith, you don't know how much I appreciate it. You gave me credit for uh, pushing you into this. I think it was Joel that really pushed you into it. But I'm glad we both did that. Oh, how great to see you. And some of you have been so nice to come up to me and say, oh, Harold, you're looking good. <laughs> I appreciate that. You need glasses, I know, but uh, uh, it made me realize again that I've reached that third stage of life, and you know the three stages of life, childhood, adulthood, and you're looking good. <laughs> Heritage is something great. And I hope that those of you who have never seen uh, the work that Francis and I did on uh, the Darden family and the Williams family, that was my mother's family, uh, we got those books out there on, on the table. You might want to take a look at them. Charles, yes, did you pass out in all of those yes, of, uh, family trees? Those of you that have the family tree in front of you, you might want to look at it while I talk just a little bit about the family. I want to go back to how we got, got here. Uh, the garden name is either of French or English origin. I don't know which back in those days it was John of Arden, uh, John of the Ardennes, uh, John Durden, which in French means hard to. Uh, John uh, Durden, which means the thicket. Our first ancestor that came to America was uh, Stephen Darden, and his holdings in England was known as the thicket. And during the reign of Charles I, he and his wife uh, were married, and uh, uh, Three children immigrated to America and settled into the area around uh, uh, Southampton. They, uh, his first land grant there uh, was on the Nanzim River, was 169 acres, I believe. Back uh, in 2004, Mim and Cindy and I went over, over to Suffolk, that's the area now where he settled. And for two days, we searched trying to find the, uh, the property called the Thicket, evidently not there anymore. Uh, we did a lot of walking. We had hoped to walk in the path of our forefathers, but don't know whether we did or not. But we uh, uh, did walk along the Nanzium River and we found it, uh, a street named Darden. Hmm. And four generations of Dardens lived in Virginia, uh, uh, fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, then then uh, five of them, five families, moved from Virginia uh, down that route through the Carolinas, down through into Georgia, and settled in Wilkes County, at that time Wilkes County, on the Williams Creek, at Williams Creek. That's, now that's a, 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 a line between Tolliver and Warren counties. Uh, Stephen Darden and his wife Ann were charter members of the Church of Christ. There were 37 people who started that church in 1787, and uh, later it became the Baptist Church. And Charles, I guess we had been talking about whether there were any Dardens at the Long Cane Church, Presbyterian Church, and evidently not, because Elaine said she did not find any Lanes or Dardens listed. So you may have been right when you said to me they probably were bad. So 
I'd have been Methodist. I don't know. I'd have been Methodist. I was a Methodist church there, too. But it's interesting to note that our Darden lineage is the co-mingling of two Darden families. Uh, from the five from the five that moved from Virginia down to Wilkes County, Georgia. Stephen and Jethro. Stephen is the grandfather of Green Darden. My great grandfather, who married Lou Roney, my great grandmother, whose father was Jethro Darden. Now, if you look at that chart, it will explain it a little bit better uh, that they were first cousins once removed. This is good to keep it in the family, you know. <laughs> Green and Lerona had only one child, John Henry Weaver Darden, my grandfather. Now, both Green and Lerona died young, and Lerona's brother, of, uh, uh, I believe it was Stephen, and his wife, Frances, took John Henry and raised him in Morgan County. When he grew up, he was studying to be a, a doctor, married Martha Mapp. They had one child. Uh, the mother and child both died in childbirth, and so John Henry became an eligible bachelor again. And it was at that time that a young lady who was a student at uh, LaGrange College cast her hook in line. That was Mary Jane Rebecca Lane. Uh, she is of the eighth generation of Lanes in America, and we've done research on that family, and there's some of it out in the, uh, for you there. Her antecedents are English. Richard Lane immigrated to America in 1679 and settled in the Jamestown area. And then uh, we'll followed the Darden's trek, I mean, the uh, we'll trek down through the Carolinas uh, after four generations had lived in Virginia. And they settled in the areas around uh, 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 Greene County, Wilkes County, Morgan County, Jasper County. Uh, my great grandfather, Shepherd Gwynn Lane, moved from Jasper County in 1832 or 33 to Troop County. And uh, his, Francis Harrison, one of my first cousins, tells this little story about Shep, said that Shep's sister Martha, seeing the family possessions getting out of reach today, came to LaGrange, rode a stallion from Jasper County to Troop County raised hell with uh, Shep for getting all of the family belongings. Shep had to give her several fine horses, a yoke of oxen, and several of the best slaves. She got all of these, and then she headed out to Florida with only uh, well, horses, oxen, and slaves. It was Christmas, 1850, when Mary Jane Rebecca Lane Christmas holidays at LaGrange College, went over to uh, 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 Forsyth, Georgia, in Morgan County to visit her Aunt Polly Lane. While she was there, at one of the Yule parties, she met the young doctor, John Henry Weaver, and uh, fell in love. So rather than come back to, uh, to Georgia, back to college at, at LaGrange, she stayed in Morgan County until Cupid finally found his mark and they got engaged. And uh, in 16 and 17, 18 and uh, uh, 51, they married at their, bar, at their uh, parents' home here in uh, uh, Troop County. As a wedding gift, her father gave Mary Jane two, two female slaves, one housemaid and one personal maid. My oldest sister, Mary Darden Davis, taught one of, of uh, the slave's grandchildren in school. And she talked about what a coincidence that was. After the wedding, Mary Jane and J.H.W. moved back to Morgan County. Uh, J.H.W.'s health failed him, and so he had to give up medicine and 
became a farm. Uh, five of their first children, they had 13 children, and five of their first five of their children were born in Morgan County. And then on the 11th of January, 1858, they bought two and a half acres, 202 and a half acres, from Benjamin H. Hill on what is now Tiber Road. So Lord Community has, been, has sheltered Dardens for over 154 years. They cut trees from the property, built a long house, added more rooms as the family grew. The story is told that grandfather had the longest name of any person in Troop County. His real name was John Henry Weaver, Randolph Teaver, Sterling Dunson Darden. God knows where all that came from, so for our purposes, he'll just be J.H.W. or John Henry Weaver. My, my father, Charles Ridley Darden, is the 11th child of that union. My mother-in-law, Minnie Pike, tells an interesting story on my dad. She said that Charlie Darden loved the girls. He said we were to dance one time, and he asked Sally Green to dance with him. She said no, and he said, well, you just go to hell. <laughs> the next morning, some of his older sisters told Grandpa what Daddy had done. So Daddy made him get on a horse and ride down into the Long Cane community over 10 miles to apologize. When Daddy got there, Mr. Green was sitting out under a shade tree out in the front yard, and as was customary in that time, he said, well, Charlie Darden, light and come in. Light and get off of your horse and come in, you know. He said, no, sir. He said, but I would like to speak to Miss Sally if it's convenient. So Mr. Green called Sally, and she came tripping out and said, hey, Charlie. He said, Sally? You know where I told you to go last night? She said, yeah. Well, I come this morning to tell you you needn't go unless you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so having apologized, <laughs> Daddy turned his horse around and came back home. My dad uh, well, had bought the old home place before my grandfather died in 1892. Mary Jane continued to live in the home place until she died. Both of them were buried up in here at Lord Church. In the summer of 1896, someone told my dad that uh, well, Bill Williams over in the Harmony community across the river from Weadke, uh, uh, from Abbotsford, had some uh, nice Duroc pigs for sale. Daddy had never been to the Williams house before, but he found it, and he and Mr. Williams started down uh, to the barn. Well, Mr. Williams had been cut in hay and had it stacked out in front of the barn, ready to lift up into the loft. And several of his girls were out playing, jumping out of the loft, into the pile of hay. One of them was Mary Emma. And when she jumped, a gust of wind caught her dress and threw it up over her head. And Daddy always said that he saw Mama's ass before he ever saw her face. <laughs> they were married. Charles Ridley and Mary Emma had 12 children. They were affectionately known as, Dard as uh, Charles has indicated as Aunt Molly and Uncle Charlie. I want to tell you just a little bit about each one of the, 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 the members of the family, the 12 children. Mary Dallas was the first child. Mary was the sweet one. All of the brothers and sisters called her sister, and she bothered us all. 
She graduated from Georgia State College for Women at Milledgeville. And on the 24th of June, 1920, she married a World War II veteran from the World War I veteran, Ralph Davis, here in Lloyd Church. Now, Mama didn't go to the wedding. She was seven months pregnant with me. And in those days, pregnant women who were that far along didn't go out in public. Well, Ralph graduated from Auburn, got a lot of Auburn graduates here. In, in 1939, he was beef cattle specialist at the University of Georgia. He and Mary took me in. And I did my first two years at the university. In the spring of 1941, Gene Talmadge was governor of Georgia. He called up Dr. Harmon, who was president of the university at that time, and said, I've been over to England and bought me a prize bull. I want you to send your beef cattle man down here to see him. So Dr. Harmon sent Ralph down to Mac Ray to the Talmadge farm. And Ralph said that he'd never seen a bull more sway back, no body confirmation. He said that, Ralph said, but out of courtesy, I walked around and looked at him real good several times, and finally, Governor Talmadge said, well, what do you think about it? Governor Talmadge, by the way, had paid something like $10,000 for the uh, bull, or so it's been reported. That was at the time when they were trying to get her for Jenna Deuce into Georgia. So we asked Ralph, said, what do you think of it? Ralph looked up at the, Ralph now, let me tell you, Ralph was a great big old six foot four man like Frank Jr. over here. He, didn't nobody mess with him. He spoke his mind often without thinking. And so when the governor said, what do you think of him? He said, governor, he ain't worth a damn you got took. <laughs> <laughs> well, the governor didn't like it. What he said at all. So he cussed Ralph out good and said, fella, you are fired. And so when Ralph got back to Athens, sure enough, he was fired. <laughs> well, that's not the only thing that the governor messed in about the University of Georgia, but that was one of the prime things that caused the university to lose its accreditation in 19, early 1942. That early 1941. Okay. The, the twins, Ruth and Ruby, came next. They were the lively ones in the family. Identical twins. Our own brothers and sisters couldn't tell them apart. Uh, their boyfriends couldn't tell them apart. <laughs> When they were dating, if one of them didn't feel like going on the date, then the other one went with them. <laughs> the boy never knew the difference. <laughs> they were both in the first graduating class of nurses from Henry University. They both married in their parents' homes, Ruby first in 1925, to David Waldo Bailey of the Long Cane community. They moved to Atlanta, Waldo was in the uh, grocery business, and Ruby was a private duty nurse. My first job after graduating from Auburn was the Sister County agent in Decatur, right, right next door to Atlanta. And so at least once a month, Francis and I went to family night suppers at, Mary and, at uh, uh, Ru Ruby and Waldo's. That for five years, I know at least. Ruby always laughed about every time that uh, uh, she would go in Rich's or in, uh, in Davidson's, that somebody from her range would tap her on the shoulder and say, Miss Bradfield, what are you doing up here? <laughs> well, Ruby would laugh about it. Ruby never smoked a cigarette in her life, but she died of lung cancer. She and Waldo had five children. Ruth lived 10 years, and one day when, excuse me, Ruth, Ruth lived 10 years and one day after Ruby died. She married in 1927 to J.D. Bradfield, a widower from LaGrange with three small children. 
And she loved her stepchildren just as much as she loved her own three children. J.D. was a farmer and always grew the largest watermelons in the county, often 75 to 100 pounds in one watermelon. They were delicious, a lot of heart in them. Ruth was the county school nurse working for the county, going to all of the schools, looking after the kids, doing their inoculations and so forth. And Ruth would laugh and say, every time she'd drive up in the schoolyard, some kid would recognize her and holler, run, 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 here comes that damn ghost shot lady. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. She, I tell you, she, she was something else. Ruth and Ruby and Mary and Annie all born in the old log house in the same room that my dad was born in, possibly in the same bed. Ruth remembers the house burning. It was the night before Thanksgiving in 1904. One of the niggers had taken up ashes out of the fireplace into a, a wooden basket and set them behind the kitchen stove while he ate his supper. When he got through eating, evidently he forgot about the ashes. And during the night, the house caught fire. Ruth says she remembers how large the flames were and the sparklers that just went all up in the sky. Finally, Ruth and Ruby got tired, went back in the house and went to bed. When well, Mama missed them, another one of the Negro men ran into the house and found them and got one on each arm. And just as the house was falling in, he made his way outside. Mm. Ruth said that his feet were burned real bad. Mm. On Ruth's 90th birthday, her children held a reception here at Lloyd Church. The LaGrange paper picked up on the 90th birthday. That was something unusual uh, back then. Uh, Elmo, me and you, and some of the others saw uh, in here. That isn't so unusual, is it? Uh, the, the, so the LaGrange News sent a uh, young lady out to interview Ruth. And during the interview, she said, uh, uh, Miss Bayfield, did you ever smoke? And she said, no, I tried it, but I didn't like it. I said, well, uh, did you ever drink liquor? And she said, well, I tried that too, but it burned. And she said, Miss Bayfield, were you ever bedridden? And she said, oh, Lord, honey, hundreds of times. <laughs> and twice in the buggy. <laughs> she was a chip. She lived to be 93. The fourth child was Annie. Annie O'Weeder. Where did that O'Weeder come from? God only knows. I don't. Anne was the pretty one. Grandpa J.H.W. got the idea that a lot of money could be made in the silk market. So he cleared out a plot of land there next to the house, the old log house, and planted old 25, 30 mulberry trees. When they got some size on them, they, he introduced the silkworm to them. And it was then that he recognized that uh, the harvesting of the silkworms was just so intensive that he had to give up that idea completely. But the Mulberry Grove became a playground for all of the children, our family's children, and the neighbor across the street family children, who were our first cousins. And uh, they would play down in the Mulberry Grove. And, one time, Lucille, daughter, Lucille Newsom tells a story that <clears throat> Ann climbed up in one of the mulberry trees and said, you sinners, listen up. I'm going to preach, and my text is when Peter pistoled on Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Her son Marvin carried on the tradition. Marvin couldn't pass his tree stump without getting up on it and orating about something. <laughs> Anne graduated from Oberthorpe University, taught school. She married Julian Jones, and they had two children. 
Lucille was the fifth child. She was the redhead in the family. And Greg Darden, uh, Greg Carter, uh, who was the Betty's grandson, was the next redhead in the in the family. When Lucille was nine years old, she and Margaret Hudson went down into the woods behind the house exploring. An old sow had had some pills, pigs down in a deep gully. Well, they couldn't get a good view of the pigs up on the side of the gully. And so there was a tree that was growing out over the gully. And so Lucille climbed out on that tree and she, she was holding on with one hand and counting the pigs with the other fingers, you know, and she lost the balance and fell, landed right on the side. With sow and pigs scattered and Lucille had two broke arms. Lucille, the, uh, my sister Betty and I loved her boyfriend, Grover Newsom. He had a candy store. Yeah. <laughs> and he always bought, a, bought a, a bag of candy for me and Betty. Lucille lived longer than anyone in the family, 97 years. She died in the mountains up in North Carolina on Utah Mountain. Her son, Grover Jr., uh, put the casket in the back of his pickup truck, headed out to Orlando, and we went down for the funeral. She and Grover had just two children. Charlie Will was the first boy in our family. He was spoiled rotten. <laughs> he was the fox hunter. During my growing up years, there were always 10 or 20 fox hounds on the front porch and the back porch or under the house or out under the shade trees. Charlie Will had a contract with the poultry processing plant there in LaGrange for them to save all of the chicken feet for him. And he would go get them about twice a week and I can hear those old dogs now just a chomping on those chicken bones. <laughs> My brother, Charlie Will, uh, Charlie Will was bad to drink. And he, uh, 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 when he, when he got drunk, he was mean. And my brother-in-law, Dick Pike, can attest to that. Dick said one night we were playing cards, and uh, uh, Charlie Will had had too much to drink, and he accused me of cheating. Dick said he wasn't, but Charlie Will drew his gun on him. And so Dick said, you know, Charlie Will, you can have my hand, you can have the pot, I'm out of here. He said Charlie Will came over the next day and uh, apologized, but Dick said he never played cards with him again. <laughs> Charlie Will fought in World War II and uh, were down in the African campaign, and when he came back, he was a changed person. He married Bessie Palmer before he went into the army. And all of his younger Randy nephews and Betty's children, boys, and all used to love and sp come and spend nights with Charlie Will and Bessie and go fox hunting with Charlie Will. Bessie, by the way, Charles mentioned that she was 101 years old. Uh, they had only one child, Mary, who lived less than a day. Molly and Charlie's seventh child was Henry Richard Darden. He was my hero. He was my friend, my brother. I was a teenager during the Depression years, the 1930s. Like the girls, wanted to have dates. Richard was the only one that had a job, the only one who had any money, the only one who had a car. And so he would loan me his car to go take my girl and give me a dollar to go take my girl to the picture show and buy us a hamburger and a Coca-Cola afterwards. A dollar would do that back then. Yeah. In Christmas 1941, I was at 1940, 1943. I, was, I had been in the Army for a while, but I was stationed in uh, uh, North Carolina at Camp Davis out in the boondocks. 30 miles from the nearest town. 
couldn't make it home in three days and make it back. Uh, Richard and Olin McCain, who ran a used car agency there at Lee's Crossing, came and got me and took me back and got me back 10 minutes before my pass expired. I dared not ask where the gasoline rations came from. I was just thankful. You talk about brotherly love. You can't beat it. After Francis and I moved to Athens, Rip and Mabel would come to every football game and stay with us. Oh, we did enjoy their visits. And then after Francis's mother died, whenever we would come to LaGrange, we would usually stay with Rip and Mabel, and Rip was at home in that grocery store by then. And many of you remember the big old walk-in cooler. Well, several of Rip's friends were always bringing him a mason jar with their family recipe in it. And uh, on this particular occasion, Rip said, got something I want you to taste. So we were back in the cooler. Now, I'm not a connoisseur of moonshine, but I tell you, that was cool. That was cool. It was good. Well, that Saturday afternoon, Rip and I both visited the cooler several times, and when Mabel called us to come to supper, neither one of us were feeling any pain. Well, we went up for supper, and we were standing around the kitchen table, and Mabel asked us to join hands and said, Daddy, you ask the blessing. Well, Rip rocked back and forth a couple of times, and we were all bowed over, and Rip said, Dear Mabel. <laughs> well, we all looked up. Rip looked up. And then he looked up high and said, Excuse me, Lord, I think so much of both of you. I just got confused. <laughs> was the eighth child. Frank was an optimist. I can just see that little grin on his mm -hmm. face. Frank Jr. just got it. Mm -hmm. Anybody that, that he knew come into the shop and Frank would greet him with, hey, sure. Mm -hmm. Any of you who knew Frank, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Hey, sure, he knew everybody. Always smiling. When he was a kid, he loved to pull pranks on his older sisters. An old two-story house that we lived in had a big hall down the middle of the downstairs and a big hall down the middle of the upstairs and had an L-shaped porch on the front and one on the back. Had a door from the upstairs where the boys all slept that opened out onto the roof of the front porch. Well, whenever one of the girls would have a date, they'd use it. We had a big swing over the L part of the porch. Whenever one of the girls would have a date, they'd use it to sit out in that swing to entertain. Frank Jr. would, I mean, no, excuse me. Frank would, Frank would, Frank would, Frank would, slip out of that door onto the roof of the porch and he'd tiptoe over to where the swing was. He'd get over to the side and he'd pee pee over the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, that didn't go too well for the girl trying to entertain my day. <laughs> and they were hollering and threatening to tell Mama. I don't think they ever did. If they did, Mama laughed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Frank was the first boy to go to college. He spent two years at Martha Berry, learned to be an auto mechanic, opened his own shop, put his mom money on the duck, Aflac, made a mint, buried Lucille Hornsby, and had one son, Frank Jr. Fred Darden was the ninth child. He was the brother I never knew. And I often wonder how, if he had lived, how it would have impacted the family. 
Grandpa Williams wrote, Molly, I dreamed the baby had a tooth pull. I'm afraid your baby isn't going to make it. Fred would nurse and then throw it back up. The doctors in the Grange were never able to determine what his problem was. And when Ruth and Ruby finished their course at Emory, they decided that he didn't have an opening between his stomach and his intestines. Just a little operation these days would have corrected it. He lived two months. Then came Roy Eugene Darling. Roy was the one who stayed at home and looked after mom and dad and while the rest of us went off to school, got married and so forth. He, he was a, uh, a clerk at the Colonial Hotel in LaGrange and then a typesetter at the, uh, the LaGrange Daily News. He was an avid possum hunter, a good wine maker. He made some of the best corn cob wine that I've ever tasted. When I was in school at UGA, I came home at Thanksgiving and Francis met me at the bus station. We went out to Hillside to go to the movie. Roy stayed at home picking the turkey, getting ready for Thanksgiving and sampling his produce. And he came to LaGrange looking for us. I came in the movie house hollering, Francis, Harold. Fortunately, we were seated near the back was able to get to him before the ushers did. Well, we came on our home, and uh, 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 we were sitting around visiting with Mom and Daddy, and Mom said, Roy, did, uh, did you pick the turkey? And Mom, Roy said, yes, sir. He's in the refrigerator. And Mom said, well, I better go seasoning him, get ready for, to cook him in the morning. So Mama went and opened the door to the refrigerator and the turkey fell out onto the floor and got up on his two legs, naked as a jaybird, got up on his two legs and wobbled around and said, gobble, gobble. And Mama said, Roy, you didn't kill the turkey. <laughs> Roy said, Mama, that turkey said he don't want to die. <laughs> oh, Lord. Roy married Alice Bible. They never had any children. But uh, Alice had four from a previous marriage, and Roy loved them and his grandchildren dearly. Next, next came Harold. That's me. <laughs> I was afraid you wouldn't know it's all over name tag. Uh, oh, how fortunate I was. Five sisters, four brothers older than I was. I love going to school. Charlie Will used to say, Harold, are you going to ever finish school? But anyway, uh, I went to center school along with Elmo. We were in the same grade. In fact, uh, well, I was salutatorian when we graduated. Elmo, wherever you are, was valedictorian. Elmo, we won't tell them how many were in the class. There were 13. <laughs> On October the 2nd, 1942, I was a senior at Auburn, enlisted in the Army, and in January 1945, I was in Europe in the infantry in the Battle of the Bulge. On the seventh day of May 1945, I was at Falkenstein, Germany, on the border of Czechoslovakia, and 9.45 in the morning, the Germans surrendered. They talk about war. It's a different war today. And my company, C, a little over 200 men that started out. When the Germans surrendered, there were only 12 of the original left. Now, they all had been killed, but they'd been wounded and had to send, be sent to the rear. Our unit, the 87th Golden Aiken Division, was uh, uh, ordered to the Pacific to participate in the 
onslaught of the Japan mainland. We came to Fort Bend in Georgia, we were given 30 days leave. And while I was home on the 11th day of August, Japan surrendered and we parted all night. My hero is Harry Truman. He authorized use of the atomic bomb that saved my life and the lives of thousands of young men and women. I came home, finished up my degree at Auburn, went over to the University of Georgia and applied for a job. They sent me to Decatur, Georgia as an assistant county agent. Then as a county agent in Carroll County and then I was transferred to Athens as an assistant professor of agriculture and assistant state, associate state forage club leader. My first assignment was to work with a lady on the forage staff, Martha Harrison, and we were to do, our challenge was to develop a camping program for the Rock Eagle Forage Club Center that had just been completed down at Edens in Georgia. What a challenge to develop a program that would be meaningful for the thousand young people who would come each Monday morning, every Monday morning, for a week at camp. Martha and I would patrol the area at night when lights were out. One night we were riding down on the, on the lake front I saw a shadow out on the footbridge across one finger of the lake. Martha stopped the car. I got out and yelled, Hey, boy, what you doing out there? And a male voice came back, I ain't doing nothing. And then a little female voice, He ain't even tried. <laughs> So much for missed opportunities. <laughs> okay, I served at the university for 30 years. During my tenure, I received many honors, for which I'm proud. I'd like to tell you about one. I went back to Washington in uh, uh, 2004 and was inducted into the Washington, was inducted into the National Forage Hall of Fame. Bonnie Charles. Mm -hmm. Bonnie and Charlie completed their dozen with Betty Jane. She was spoiled. How could she not be? With five older sisters and four older living brothers. She graduated from Center High School. Took a beauty parlor course in took a beauty course in Atlanta and worked at J.P. Allen's in the beauty department. She lived in the boarding house, the same one that Francis was living in. During World War II, Betty worked in the shipyards at Savannah. A lot of asbestos dust that later gave gave her lung cancer that later killed her. She was the stubborn one of the family. Oh, Emma, you know what I'm talking about. Hell and high water took that, took that to make her change her mind about anything. My family spent spent its vacations with the Phipps. She married Bill Phipps at the Phipps home uh, every Christmas for many years. Charles has already said how pleased he was to have cousins from two other garden families with us. Let me just say how appreciative I am to see them and to see all of, all of Molly's and Charlie's grandchildren. Uh, uh, oh, I'm going to tell you one little thing about about uh, Uncle John. 
It was John Henry Weaver the third, and his farm and my dad's farm joined each other, and so uh, Uncle John's uh, crew and my mom and daddy's crew, we were together at, at each other's home almost daily. I love to go down to Uncle John's farm. Uncle John ran the dairy. He kept the milk down in the cellar of the house. It was always cool down there. And ain't Nanny, bless her heart, made the best ice cream of any I've ever tasted. She was a sweet, sweet lady, and this hall is named in her honor. One time, Aunt Nanny, I, uh, mistook a, a, a sack of arsenic and emptied it into her flower bin and made biscuits and poisoned the entire family. They didn't die, but they, they were mighty sick. So we wind up this saga of the Charles and Miriam and Darden clan, totaling 270 descendants. Among them are 18 girls named Mary, <laughs> that grand old name. Thirty who went to the University of Georgia, and two who lost their way and went to that trade school in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> so I want Dave and Dick to stand up and take a bow. 